Um, I missed the deadline for slides, and I um, was a little upset about it because they're like a crutch for me, but then I decided to go with it, and it's been incredibly liberating. I don't have slides today, um, <laughs> and I'm happy to tell you that. Um, so, so I'm here also to talk about cost, and I think um, kind of what I'm going to say is, is, is very complimentary to what's happening at uh, UMUC. I work for Achieving the Dream. Uh, we are actually not brand new. We've been around since about 2006. Has anybody heard of Achieving the Dream before? Okay, great. Um, so if you don't know about Achieving the Dream, we started as a, as a kind of a grant-funded, Lumina-funded um, project that, and then we um, kind of became a nonprofit a few, few years ago. And we really work on, we are member institutions, and we work exclusively with community colleges to um, work with them to kind of a holistically transform the institutions to meet their student success goals. Uh, so not just OER, but a number of initiatives. Um, we work with our member colleges to um, improve their outcomes. Uh, and OER is really one of the newest initiatives that we have um, at, at ATD. Uh, what my argument today is, I'm talking about lowering costs, uh, but I think when we talk about lowering costs, it's very important, but really lowering costs is just um, a step towards kind of a larger goal. Uh, lowering so costs, especially for community college students, is a, a, a step towards a, a goal of increasing student outcomes, uh, student completions, and uh, helping students, uh, community college students meet their goals. Today uh, is uh, the day um, I'm gonna talk about this initiative called the OER Degree Initiative, and we just today released our first uh, research report on launching OER Degree Pathways. So if you go to the Achieving the Dream website on the news section, you'll be able to download that and get probably more than you need to know uh, about, uh, <clears throat> about this initiative. So at Achieving the Dream, we, um, we focus on seven capacities at, at colleges uh, to, that they need to focus on to kind of improve their success, teaching and learning, equity, leadership and vision, uh, strategy and planning. And, and so we go into colleges and really work with the colleges in a holistic way. Um, and OER really fits into all the seven capacities, uh, particularly OER degrees, uh, which I'll talk about in a second. But first, I'm gonna have a pop quiz. So uh, you need to get out your pens and paper. Sorry, sorry. Um, so here's the first question. The more expensive course materials are, the better they are, or the more effective they are. True or false? False, okay. Uh, all right, next question. The student, uh, the more a student pays for course materials, the better that student will do in the course. False, okay. True or false? Assuming a textbook is an integral part of a course, sometimes a big assumptions, uh, a student who does not buy a textbook for a course should do just as well as a student who does. Oh, let's, some hesitation. Assuming the textbook is an integral, integral part of the course, can you go without it? Right. Right. Uh, similar to uh, my hotel up the street of the Hilton, um, I can buy a can of Coke at their uh, convenience store. It's three bucks for a can, uh, but it tastes much better, right? Uh, <laughs> so, so, I mean, clearly there's a disconnect between the kind of cost of course materials and what we really should be focusing on, which is outcomes, right? Student goals. Um, and, and so I think that's a really important piece. Uh, students value uh, kind of quality courses. They value instruction. Um, they know when they get this $200 textbook and read three chapters out of it, they, they feel ripped off by that. And I think students more and more are, you know, as we see from the, from the data, they're finding ways to get the materials cheaply or if they can. They're, you know, trading with other students um, and they're doing what they can to get the materials. Um, I did have some, some really kind of ad hoc uh, conversations with some student groups at Montgomery, Montgomery College in Maryland, as well as a borough of Manhattan. And uh, I got a quote from one of the students, which was, uh, I use the course to supplement what I learn online. And I was like, Shouldn't, don't you mean the opposite? <laughs> you, no. Um, so, so, basic, so basically, they, they really want it, they're really striving to kind of learn something, and they want to learn it. But course materials and the expense of course materials, especially for community college students, uh, is a barrier. Uh, so why should we care? And why should you guys care about this? Um, have any of you read uh, Sarah Goldrick Rabb's uh, book, um, Paying the Price? Okay, you should read it. Um, it's a really good it's a study of community college students in Wisconsin, uh, and she looks at specifically financial aid and expenses, 
And uh, there's some really you know, interesting uh, information, but really sad <laughs> uh, information in the book when you look at just average, you know, the average population of community college students today and some of the challenges they're facing. Um, financial aid is not designed for these working students, right? There's a lot of kind of barriers and obstacles to even getting the financial aid that they, they qualify for and some of the kind of arcane rules. So there's that. But there's also some, some, some really depressing uh, information about student hunger. Community college students who are hungry, don't get enough to eat, as well as homeless. Uh, so, you know, when they decide to attend college, if they're homeless or hungry, right, that's a motivated student, right? But they have to make some pretty hard choices oftentimes. And um, I think you uh, pointed out some of the statistics about kind of adoption of textbooks, but there's a um, 2016 student textbook and course material survey out of the Florida Virtual Campus Survey. Um, significant number of students take fewer courses because of expense. They don't register for a specific course because of the textbook costs. They drop courses, withdraw, earn a poor grade because, specifically because of this, or fail a course, or don't even purchase the required textbook. Um, so again, assuming that these textbooks are important pieces of, of courses um, and a student is not having that material, they're not going to do well. And, and we know also from research if you, you know, momentum counts for community college students. So the more courses you take and are successful in, the, the higher the chance you're going to be successful. The more barriers you encounter that you have to stop out, you're not going to come back, right? And that's not what we want. We have a really kind of miserable completion rate at community colleges that, you know, uh, we have a solution for, which is, which is more and more open educational resources. Um, so, you know, the cost of course materials really affects a, co a college student's future, uh, whether they're going to succeed, whether they can even access these courses. Um, but like I said, it's a, it's a symptom of a larger problem, I think. And, and I think the reason that achieving the dream is involved in uh, looking at uh, uh, open educational resources. Because when you start looking at costs, you got how we got to this situation where we have these publisher textbooks that are so exorbitantly expensive, it really opens the door at looking at uh, some other issues, uh, kind of structural issues within community colleges. Um, how do we measure efficiency or efficacy in higher ed, right? How do we know that uh, a course works, right? Is it, is it the grades, uh, or, you know? Um, what is effective teaching, and how is it being done in community college classrooms? My uh, screen keeps popping back. What is the role of faculty at institutions, and what should their role be? How does the internet or you know, the access to the information that's on the internet, how should it change? How has it changed education or knowledge creation? How should it? Um, what are the institu institutional costs of a student dropping out? Because there are costs to that. You invest in a student and a student drops out and doesn't come back. That costs a college money. And that, that's often costs that they, they're not looking at uh, as far as their um, kind of bottom line, I suppose. And what is a student's role, uh, or what does a student's role need to be in knowledge creation and content creation? And <clears throat> uh, for, uh, for achieving the dream, these are not just cost issues. These are kind of institutional, structural issues uh, that, uh, that we see as opportunities. Um, and the reason we think, uh, you know, we look at institutional issues is because uh, when we first started out, after the first five years, uh, achieving the dream did a deep study of its outcomes something that, again, that often institutions don't do, and found that for the past five years, uh, achieving the dream hadn't been really that effective, hadn't moved the needle at these institutions. And the particular reason was uh, the way achieving the dream was approaching it was like kind of discrete, ad hoc kind of uh, initiatives that weren't really connected together. Uh, and so since then, we've really seen the, the advantage of going into an institution, really looking deeply at the kind of the structural issues. You know, for textbook costs or, you know, completion issues, we tend to either blame students, right? It's the, it's the students that we get, right? We're all access institutions. It's, that's the problem. Or faculty. We blame faculty a lot for, um, you know, uh, courses that, that have poor outcomes. But really, these are institutional issues. Um, and OER really uh, allows, uh, you know, there's, it's a... You know, it's a, a free issue, right? But the openness of OER really needs to be emphasized. What you can do with these materials. Um, how many planets are there? In, the, in our solar system? Is Pluto Eight or nine? Eight. Well, that, right, exactly. 
uh, at some point when I was going to school it was nine, right? And then what, 2006, I think? Uh, Pluto, sadly, was downgraded to a, a dwarf planet, so there's eight. Overnight, those astronomy textbooks were, you know, they were, they were obsolete, they had some incorrect information in them, right? Um, they added, I don't know if you know this, they, uh, last year they added four new elements to the periodic chart, right? Uh, when I was taking chemistry, I opened the flap of my tech hardcover textbook and there was the periodic chart on there, right? Uh, so, the, so again, you know, knowledge is changing quickly. The things that we thought were kind of stable, um, they, they change quickly. And that is not something that kind of commercial publishing is very good at keeping up with. OER can, right? You have currency. It allows currency. It allows faculty much more control over kind of what they teach and how they teach. They're not teaching that extra chapter because it's $200 and they feel bad. Um, you know, the, to teach a chapter or three chapters or five that they don't feel really confident about. Um, and they can choose the best resources for whatever acti activity or whatever outcome they want. Uh, so at ATD, um, so if we think about UMUC and, and kind of their uh, initiative, what we look at is once an institution starts to kind of invest OER, has a kind of a groundswell of faculty, has these initiatives going, um, that uh, the next step for that is to create what we think OER degree or OER degree pathways, right? Uh, which is um, with, a, with a faculty member, you can do this independently. You can do an OER course. But to do an OER degree, you need a kind of institutional effort. You need uh, you know, IT services. You need student services to be involved. You need to figure out a way to promote it to students. Uh, so an OER degree is uh, for, for, for community colleges an associate degree or a certificate. As a, you know, all the required courses and some elective courses um, are uh, created with open educational uh, uh, resources, right? So a student can move through this over two years or one year if it's a cert certificate and not pay any textbook costs. So in th two and a half minutes, let me tell you about this initiative. Um, for the OER degree initiative, what we've done, we've got funding from the Hewlett Foundation. We're funding 38 community colleges across the country. This is the largest OER initiative to date, uh, to create OER degree pathways. So they need to create at least one pathway at their, their colleges, pilot these courses. Um, it also includes a research and evaluation piece. I told you about that study that was released today. So we're looking at academic outcomes of OER degree programs. We're looking at economic outcomes. How much does it cost to do these, th these degree programs? And how much, you know, what are the benefits? What are the returns for keeping those students or lowering the cost for students? And implementation, what does it take, you know, what are the best practices for that? Um, and so uh, colleges are developing a, a number of degrees, general studies, liberal studies, business, health, and health sciences. Um, and they're also looking at sustainability issues, which is something that's not always done. If this works, right, if you're getting the kind of results that we think you're getting, how are you going to bake it into what you do institutionally? How are you going to connect it to your student success and, uh, and, and continue to, uh, to, to use it for your students? I encourage you to go download the report from our website. And um, again, if you have any questions, I'll, I'll be around. I'm happy to answer them. But thank you very much for your time.